I'm Kathy Abrams, and I'm delighted to be here to interview my colleague, Eleanor Swift. I'm a professor at the law school, as Eleanor has been, and we've known each other for close to 20 years now. Uh -huh. Eleanor was on the faculty when I joined in 2001, and um, she was an important part of why I decided to come here, because the, the stories that I had heard of the women at the law school and the resistance of the women at the law school were really important to me as a feminist scholar, and I'm really eager to talk about all of that. Great. The following video interview is part of the UC Berkeley Emeriti Association's Legacy Project, which preserves the recollections and reflections of Berkeley's Emeriti. In conversation with a colleague of their choosing, Emeriti are invited to discuss their academic careers, including contributions, accomplishments, and challenges, especially as they relate to campus history. This recording is intended to provide a personal record of value to the family, friends, and colleagues of Emeriti, and to document the history of the Berkeley campus as it pertains to the individual's department, school, and college. Okay, Eleanor, you graduated from law school in 1970, and you joined the faculty of Bolt Hall School of Law, now Berkeley Law, in 79. What did you do during those nine years? I uh, had two wonderful clerkships uh, with a district court judge first in Hartford and then the D.C. Circuit, Judge Bazelon. So, uh, and I also had my son uh, as a child, and so I had a kind of a part-time clerkship with Bazelon. But he was a great person to work for. Boy, he's a famous he's judge. He's a famous what, judge. What, did, what was the experience like clerking for him? Well, he loved me. And he was known to be rather uh, acerbic with some of his clerks, but I never got that side of him. Wow. So he was very, very avuncular. Very oh, good experience. That's great. Yeah. And then I uh, moved to Houston, Texas, with my husband and my son. And I practiced at a very large law firm, Vincent and Elkins. And I did civil litigation. So I did that for five years, and then um, the idea of academics arose. Was it something you thought about before, when you were in law school? Uh, I don't think really, because I, I was kind of a product of an uh, academic uh, environment growing up in the University of Chicago area. So I wanted to be practical and change the world, and I thought I could do that better in practice. Um, but um, after my, um, uh, I practiced with Vincent and Elkins for five years, and at that point, many major law schools were really looking for women. And uh, they, it, so this was uh, 78, 79, and uh, they called Yale, where I went to school, and uh, I was one of the names that they gave out. So I got calls from several law schools and uh, had interviews, and I just decided um, it was time for me to leave practice. I really didn't want to be a partner. I didn't want that kind of work schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was divorced at the time, so it was really just me and my son. And so I decided to uh, take, the, take the academic role uh, very seriously. And I interviewed at a couple of law schools, and I just very much liked the Berkeley attitude, the, the history of UC Berkeley and the free speech movement, et cetera. So I was uh, trying to be an activist at the same time as a, as a, um, as a, as a scholar or a lawyer. And so uh, I just made the decision to come out to Berkeley. Was it hard? When you had to transition, the firm life is utterly unlike what we experience in academics, from what I understand. I never did it. What was well, the transition uh, like? Um, it wasn't difficult in the classroom. I really enjoyed the teaching, and I taught classes, civil procedure, and evidence that grew out of my litigation experience. So that was really a lot of fun. Um, the the uh, 
solely academic side, the research, the writing, that was more challenging for me and ended up being quite challenging uh, in my career. So that's another part of our story here. And let me say here that in both important aspects of being a law professor, classroom teaching, which is very, very important in uh, the education of what are really graduate students, and uh, academic writing, obviously, I had a wonderful mentor on the faculty, Professor Robert Cole. He was a brilliant teacher, and in that first year, we were both teaching evidence. He gave me terrific feedback on my ideas about teaching for many, many classes. And when I started work on my tenure article, uh, his support, both intellectual and personal, made it a, an experience of learning for me how to write an article and also uh, wonderful feedback on my ideas. Uh, we were married later uh, in our uh, careers, and uh, our relationship, I think, uh, was really the backbone of my uh, academic career at, at Berkeley. So I wanted to say that at the, at the outset of this, this uh, interview. So let's start first with the teaching. I'm curious about what parts of your practice you thought translated into what you did in the classroom and how. Well, I did do trials, and so I, I had uh, uh, trials with partners mm -hmm. uh, and also one or two small trials on my own. And when you prepare for trial, you have to figure out who your witnesses are and whether you can get their testimony into evidence. So you study the rules of evidence. So I felt very comfortable. Uh, teaching evidence because I had a, a rich, pretty rich experience of thinking about admissibility of what my witness was going to be talking about. So that came easily. My other class, Civil Procedure, um, is a pre-trial class mostly, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it because that was a first year class. So I had uh, brand new law students and I always integrated kind of real life issues and in small sections I had them actually performing and being lawyers and making arguments. So I had a good time with that. I bet with they the had teaching. a good time with it too. They, they liked it. <laughs> they liked it. I think that for me the research and the writing was tougher. Because Why do you think? What, what seemed, did it just seem outside your experience? It, it seemed outside my experience and I didn't really know what the standards were and what kinds of topics would be approved or disapproved and uh, it's hard work. I mean, as you well know, uh, scholarship uh, and getting it published and uh, uh, showing, you know, creativity and insight. Um, that was, since I was more used to trying to persuade a jury or a judge, you know, it, rather than an academic audience, it was tough. So it was, that was the harder part of the job for me. Did the solitariness of it bother you at all? Because it seems like as a lawyer, your work would be much more social. Well, uh, I found my social uh, were really with the students. In other words, the teaching really opened up my relationships with each passing group. And I was not that close to them, but they were my audience, you know. And mm -hmm. now for academic writing, the faculty is your audience. So that, that was a, a different, a different uh, world for me. Also, a hard audience to judge because it's not like watching a jury or a group of students. You, no. you it's very hard to know what your colleagues no. think. No, and when you, you, yes, and when you have a, an audience of twenty to thirty senior faculty, most of whom you don't know very well, you really, you know, your audience is even tougher. Yes. Really. Um, from what I understand. When you joined the law faculty, there were two women on the faculty? Two women, Herma Hill Kay and Bobby Barton, and they had been on the 
faculty 20 years. Marge Schultz was hired two years before me, and so she was the other non-tenured person uh, for at least a couple of years, it was the two of us. So if there were two women hired in the 60s yeah. and two more hired in the late 70s, yes. was there hostility toward women? Was there, what sort of an environment did you find when you arrived? Um, I think that uh, there had been other women, in fact some very top graduates of the Berkeley Law School, interviewed for teaching positions, at least two of them I know of, and they did not get offers. So yes, it was, uh, it was tough. Uh, Marge Schultz was hired, I think, two years before I was, and then I came um, with this, you know, pretty sophisticated, well-known well background with Bazelon, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, so, uh, yes, it was. It was. Uh, it wasn't anything that I feared at the time, but certainly as the years, early years went by, it was clear that the older men on the faculty were uh, uh, not that not that into younger women in their field. They didn't really like it. So I. I think as we'll, we'll talk about the tenure issue. Yes. Yeah. Did you, um, was it mainly in terms of judging scholarship that this resistance on the part of the older male faculty came out? Was, was it expressed socially? Did you see any other signs of an environment that was uncomfortable? I don't think there was much sociability mm -hmm. with a lot of the top faculty, male faculty. Uh, I think that it was, it was in the uh, evaluation of the of the scholarship and uh, a sense of uh, uh, two or three people, particularly in the field. Marge's field was contracts. My field was evidence and procedure. The the top older men in those fields were were very much against both of us. Yeah. So. March was denied tenure in 1985. Yes. And you in 1987. Yes. And from what I understand, you left the school at that point. I Is left that right? the school. I walked out. And so, did you thought the environment was not receptive when you came, and two women are then denied tenure? Mm -hmm. Did you think about taking any kind of legal action or filing a grievance with the university? I didn't right away at all. Um, I uh, was very happy to just leave, to think about what else I could do, probably some type of practice. And uh, I was very happy to be a little more at home. My son was uh, in his teenage years, and so I was uh, more uh, related to his high school experience, which I, I enjoyed a lot. Um, and so uh, it wasn't, I left the school in the spring with the end of the academic year, spent the summer and a couple of months in the fall, and then I was contacted by uh, uh, Sally Fairfax, who was a professor and was working under Doris Calloway, who was the provost of professional schools at that time. And Sally uh, met with me for coffee and she said, I think you should file a privilege and tenure grievance. And uh, if you do that, then we have evidence that will support you. That Doris had been working on uh, this issue both with Marge and with my case. And uh, she didn't ever say exactly what it was. She didn't say, you know, uh, this is what you should do. But she planted the seed in my mind to, um, to file an internal university grievance on a discrimination charge. Yeah. And had Marge grieved at all? Had she made any complaint at no, that point? No, no, no. And she'd been denied tenure two years before me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm curious because you describe yourself as having had an activist side, and it sounds like you did, and also having been quite cognizant of the fact that the school, particularly its older faculty, were not receptive to women. Mm -hmm. So why didn't your um, that sort of strand of your personality come out initially when you were denied? Well, uh, it was very painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that I could take the time, as I said again, to be more with my son. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his last two years of high school, and um, it never occurred to me that I would win. Yeah. You know, um, uh, it's not an easy thing to prove discrimination. There was no smoking gun that I knew of. And uh, as a person who has worked on trials and litigation, uh, you know, you've got a jury, and so you never know. And I just felt, you know, this has been painful enough. Um, I'm not sure I want to go back mm -hmm. anyway. And uh, so I wanted to take at least, at least a year off and just, you know, figure out what I wanted to do next. Well, so it makes sense to me that, that this was really painful and you didn't want to jump back in. And, and also that, that, you know, you hadn't seen a lot of signs of substantive fairness thus far, and you might have had some doubts about what you would get if you, if you took it to a, the point of a grievance. Was there anything else? Well, I think the, the uh, provost for the professional schools at the time, um, I, I believe my memory is a little shaky that I went and talked to him because the uh, provost changed during the summer that I left the law school. And uh, that particular provost said there's no, no point. You know, this is, this is a definitive judgment and uh, you're just be, you know, throwing away your own time. So sort of grow up. Then Doris Calloway became the provost. And uh, she had Sally Fairfax as her uh, associate in the university hall. And Doris had a very, very different approach to what was happening to women across the campus. And uh, in particular, because Marge Schultz had been denied tenure, she put Sally Fairfax to work on evaluating all of the tenure cases from, I think, the 50s uh, for the law school. Yeah. And Sally spent that summer uh, in the attic of California Hall reading tenure files and evaluating what the standards, you know, had been up through that uh, long history, 20 to 30 years of history. So they decided together on a strategy to change the law school, and I was the tool <laughs> to change the law school. And um, Sally came to me. We met at uh, Strata, and we had coffee. And she said um, that if I filed a privilege and tenure grievance, there would be evidence that the law school standards had been misapplied to me. And so um, I, I took that quite seriously. In addition, I learned that as I made the decision to file this grievance, some of the faculty were interviewed about their, uh, their uh, evaluation of my case. And Professor Herma Hill Kay is well known to me to have made the stand the the statement that the uh, the man before me and then my case she said the only difference she could see between the two tenure cases was my gender and she would have testified to that if this Go had her actually on. gone to court so that was pretty yes that 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 pushed uh, the administration also to try to find a resolution uh, that would not require, you know, testimony in court. So 
Also, I believe that the Vice Chancellor Rod Park at that time made the suggestion that there be a comparative review, that my, my grievance could be resolved by uh, a committee that would evaluate the, uh, uh, the accomplishments of four to five men and compare that with mine, and that that would be a way to uh, uh, have a fair kind of judgment. Now, now was March yeah. part of that comparison? No. Or was it, it was just your it scholarship? It was just mine, right. Yes. Because then, uh, yes. So um, then um, the chair of the Privilege and Tenure Committee, Professor Sheldon Zedek, agreed to chair a committee uh, that would conduct this comparative review of my articles. My published writings would be evaluated as against the published writings of the men who had been granted tenure. I don't know the other members of the committee. I believe it was uh, two law professors and three people from out of um, uh, other law schools. They were not all evidence people, but there were at least two evidence people because most of my writing was in evidence. And um, so uh, their, their task was to, if I, if I understand it correctly, their task was to evaluate the publications of the five men who had been granted tenure most recently and me. And the result was, as I've heard, uh, and I don't have any real first-hand knowledge, that my writing was viewed by this outside committee as being in the middle of the range, and that therefore there was no reason why um, that, uh, that amount of and that quality of published research and writing um, should have been denied. Uh, tenure. Um, so that's my understanding of what happened, and uh, uh, I think that I, I also want to say that um, we were prepared to go to, my lawyers and I were prepared to go to privilege and tenure and really duke it out. Mm -hmm. And this settlement idea came through at about two in the morning. Uh, we were in a uh, a law office in Oakland, and I believe that Professor Zedek was running back and forth between the faculty representatives and my lawyers and myself trying to work out a way to settle the case. So the question was, given the conclusion that had been reached about your scholarship, what was going to follow from that practically? That yes. is, would you return to the law school with tenure? Yes. 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 And that was the deal. That that wow. that's what my lawyers insisted on. That if yes. they if they found that my scholarship was in the ballpark, then uh, I would I would get my tenure position, right? It's an amazing story. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, when you think about an institution being so proactive in terms of conducting a review of what had been happening at the law school, understanding how you fit into it, and then your sort of lawyering up and getting ready to go yeah. to the mat on yeah. it. I mean, just a lot of proactivity on both sides. Well, there yeah. were two other cases of women at that particular time. Um, and both of them used my lawyers after I <laughs> had found yes. them and trained them. And uh, one was Jenny Harrison in math, mm -hmm. and the other was Margaret Lovell in fine arts. And they both received a kind of evaluation of their work in the same way that I did. And they used my lawyers to, to do that. So that was the kind of high point and of, of uh, uncovering discrimination in so many different areas yes. of the campus. And hopefully, you know, it was a turning point where people, first of all, the younger people, the, the men at, at the law school, my age and younger, they were totally behind me. 
I mean, they, and behind Marge, they didn't like at all what the seniors were doing and what they, they, and they sat in the meetings, you know, and so they heard the discussion. So I think that this was in a sense also a turning point in the, uh, the introduction of a whole different type of man in academia that was open to the idea yes. that there'd be women. They wanted women colleagues. Yes. So that was, I think, you know, uh, 1987 um, and, and later, that was, that was what was happening, I yes. think. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, as someone who, I started teaching the year Marge was denied tenure. And so I feel like I was the beneficiary of that different kind mm -hmm. of man because I think that was happening probably not as dramatically as at Berkeley, but that sort of uh, reappraisal was happening at a yes, lot of law schools. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you came back to the law school in 1989, mm -hmm. and despite the fact that your immediate cohort, cohort widely supported you, um, it must have been strange to come back. How did? Can you tell me whether it was difficult and what what moments helped you through? Well, um, it's much easier to be a happy winner than a sore loser. <laughs> Um, I went first to the office of the dean, Jesse Choper, and he is very, <laughs> he handed me my keys <laughs> and he said, Eleanor, if you have any trouble with anybody, you tell me. So, you know, they understood what had happened. And um, when I went to the first faculty meeting, uh, Herma, Kay sat beside me. So, you know, people were very welcoming. <laughs> yeah. And um, they understood the stakes of it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think that actually Marge um, had been voted tenure just the year before me, but I think it was just undeniable that the fact that I filed the grievance, you know, made that happen. They reconsidered her case? Yes, they reconsidered the case. Oh, that's right. so interesting. And of course, uh, by the time that case came up, that decision came up, there were um, tenured men of our age group who were totally in favor of her, you know. So the whole thing changed around 18, 1987, 88, 89, yep. and that was really the turning point. So you came back to the law school sort of a victor then. And, Absolutely. And I'm wondering what you think about as your most important accomplishments once you return to the law school for keeps. Well, I, I uh, love the teaching. I continue to teach uh, uh, evidence uh, in, I think, very creative ways. I continue to teach um, uh, civil procedure, and because I had had five years of practice, which many of the faculty had not, I really tried to integrate practice role playing in the classroom so that uh, the, uh, the students would act as lawyers making an argument about the case we just read or about uh, how would you interpret that case in the next iteration. And I would write little scenarios of, you know, disputes and they would they would uh, play the lawyer and usually two of them so that they would practice together and develop their ideas together against two. And yes, that takes up time, but it was really a great, it, particularly in a small section, it really, it really was, I think, uh, a wonderful way to learn civil procedure. In evidence, I just had a lot of practice problems and we we worked on problems out loud in class and uh, 10 people were, were assigned to speak up for each week because, you know, as you know, some people aren't prepared and it's just awful to call on someone, I'm not prepared. So I always ha had assigned groups to work on these problems. So I always tried to integrate real 
applications of professional argumentation into the teaching of these two classes. And since they are litigation classes, you know, it seemed to me that was very, that was very justifiable. So I loved my teaching, and uh, I taught a couple of other seminars with colleagues, younger colleagues, and those were also, I think, very successful. So Eleanor, I have a question about how this practice-oriented approach worked in evidence, because your evidence classes were epically large. Yeah. Um, you know, students sort of waited semesters to take the class with you. How did you manage those kinds of exercises, even using 10-person panels? How did it work in a class with 100 people? Well, remember is that each class, each, uh, each week, there were three classes. So I had groups assigned mm -hmm. to prepare arguments back and forth about the case that we were going to read or the problem that I created. And uh, somehow, and I, I think I restricted uh, uh, enrollment to 100. Mm -hmm. I never took, I don't think I took more than that. Still. And they would just have to wait. <laughs> that is a big class. So, so if there are three classes and then per week, you know, you could you could do things with smaller groups as long as you identified who they were and you had a sense of what amount of time it would take to have them in a dialogue. But I thought it was very valuable to do it. So it would take 15 minutes and then we'd go on. Yeah, but I always tried to have at least one interchange like that where they made arguments because that if this, they're going to be lawyers, they have to learn how to do that. And I think the students that weren't part of the argument were probably very good listeners. Well, I hope so, because yeah. Because of, of the direct application I of think it to so. the future. I think so. Yeah. So, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. I enjoyed that. And I worked on a case book um, uh, that was uh, in its, had already been uh, one one iteration and it hadn't sold very well. So then they asked me to help them and I turned it into a more of a problem book. And then it was a much better, much more effective so case book. So people could teach from it. So they could yeah. really better teach from it rather than being so sort of philosophical. So what other kinds of scholarship did you do after you came back? Well, I really stuck with the evidence and I worked on uh, this case book and then I was asked to be a uh, author of the McCormick Treatise on Evidence, which is one of the two great treatises, and it was being revised, uh, which it is, is revised every five or six years mm -hmm. because the cases change. So I worked with a group of three or four men in evidence from around the country. It was a lot of fun. And we divided it up, and we took, each of us took our specialty, and so I did hearsay. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a lot of fun. So that's really what I, what I focused on. And uh, I was satisfied with my scholarship. It wasn't going to, uh, you know, blow over the budget committee, but uh, it was. Ha I, I liked it. And you say that in these these treatises, you were working primarily with men. I'm mm. wondering, did more women over the course of your career join the field of evidence, or is that still a male? Well, now, now in field? the in the in the younger group in our faculty, there's two wow. or three. Yeah. yeah women teaching and evidence. is that the case nationwide? Probably so. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I assume so. I don't know. Maybe it takes a while for it to trickle up it to may. the point of editing a treatise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've just re retired from the McCormick, so I can see, and I have suggested the younger woman colleague to be yes. my replacement. Yeah. So oh, we'll I hope see. that'll happen. We'll see. Yes. So then uh, uh, I, I branched out into kind of uh, trying to put put what I really believed in, which is clinical education, as not the main thing that people do in law school, but that is really such a wonderful learning tool. So um, Steve Sugarman uh, asked me to teach a companion class to the clinical uh, uh, class that students working at the East Bay Community Law Center were taking. And uh, the, the, the key point in successful clinical education is 
to have a uh, companion class where they're studying the tools that they're using, the way to which to relate to clients, particularly clients of color and clients of lower economic status, and uh, how, to, how to turn their legal knowledge into the ability to work with a client. You can always make your argument in court, but to, to find out the case, get the facts, you know, analyze it, have the client believe in you, particularly if they're an underprivileged uh, person, that was the issue that we addressed in the East Bay Community Law Center. Um, so I taught that with Steve for two years, and then the, the, the people running the law center said, well, we don't think we need you guys anymore. We want to run the, the, the class ourselves. And I said, well, okay, but I'm going to stay with it for two more years and make sure everything is going. So Steve stopped. I continued. And uh, you partnered with somebody from EPCLC. Yes, or? yes. So mm -hmm. the 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 director and uh, one of the staff attorneys. So there were three of us mm -hmm. teaching. So that was just fabulous. I loved that. And I, of course, I got to know the people in our in our law center and uh, worked very very well with them. I think. And then uh, because EBCLC was so. Uh, effective and popular, uh, Herma McKay, the dean, then asked me to chair the committee which would explore having in-house clinics at the law school. EBCLC was out in the community because it was a community center, but uh, all over legal academia, schools were beginning to really uh, explore this type of legal education, clinical uh, education. And so I chaired the committee uh, because Dean Kay appointed me, and we um, proposed uh, the first clinic, which I believe was the International Human Rights Clinic, because we had kind of a group of uh, uh, people in the building doing that already. And uh, the faculty voted for this proposal of how to start a clinic how to give credit for the clinic, you know, who to ask to lead the clinic. The whole package was, a, was, a, uh, was part of our committee report. And over the years, we now have th three very vibrant in-house clinics, death penalty, uh, clinic, uh, law, technology, and public policy, and then the international human rights. So, and those clinical faculty, are as close to being full-blown, you know, members of the faculty than uh, than I ever imagined would happen. They do write, you know, and they they do they they're more engaged in teaching perhaps than the regular faculty. But they come to all the committee meetings, all the faculty meetings, and you know, there's a few little distinctions, but. Basically, I think they're pretty comfortable within the faculty. And was that something that you you said that they had sort of succeeded and become integrated beyond what you had anticipated? Oh, yes. But did you have the goal of creating a kind of a clinical position that could, where the occupants could enjoy greater parity? That with was other? their goal. That was their they goal. They taught me. Oh, that's that so interesting. It was not really what they wanted to be fully second-class citizens. They wanted to be, you know, 90% citizens. Yeah. yeah. So they don't have everything, but they, no, absolutely, they were very committed to, you know, increasing their role within the, the school. So that, wa that wasn't me. That was them. And so at some point, I think it was shortly before I arrived in 2001, um, the school had appointed a kind of director of the whole clinical enterprise, mm -hmm. somebody that was brought in from another school. Mm -hmm. How did, w were you a part of creating that position and thinking about how that person would lead a group of clinics? Well, uh, I'm sure I was. I don't really remember. Yeah. Um, so Chuck came and um, uh, was a regular faculty member given the task of running the clinic. And I, I think there was a little friction there because the clinical people felt, you don't need, we don't need Chuck, you know. 
but he was a bridge and and it satisfied the the people on the faculty who weren't fully you know prepared to embrace clinics like that and then at some point he withdrew and does yes. his own thing right and he's a he's a faculty member and I think they were much happier so our clinical faculty sort of rotate now the running the yes. running the, the clinic right. That's right so that was a very that's very that was a very interesting um, uh, turn yes when it, they became really independent so one more thing that happened that I think uh, is is quite important is when uh, the California legislator and the California Supreme Court basically abolished the ability to admit students uh, to law school or really any educational institution on the grounds of race and that race could not so that was SP1 and the um, uh, uh, Proposition 209. So this decimated the, 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 not the necessarily the admission of people of color, but they didn't come. And they didn't come probably all over California. We had one student in 1998, a uh, student of color, and uh, no prospect in sight that uh, we could really turn this around. So it was pretty scary. And a lot, were you here in 98? No, I came in 2001. So a lot of student demonstrations, marches oh. in the hall, you know, really very highly, uh, highly tense political situation. I knew our colleague Angela Harris at that time through yes. feminist circles. And I remember her saying that it was not easy for her to get up in the morning and find purpose in her life as no. a law professor during that period. No, it was terrible for her. Yeah. And Rachel Moran, yes. the three of us bonded together and we had talked previously, but this really put a fire under us to create a center for social justice. And it would be a center at which uh, the person in charge would develop programs for the students who wanted to work on social justice and whether white or uh, African American or Hispanic, it didn't matter, but we thought that that center would be a beacon in a sense for students to think about our law school as a place in which they could thrive and so Angela, Rachel, and I worked on a plan for it. I think I was associate dean at that point under Herma. And um, we went to Herma and we said, well, we need $50,000 to start this center. So she and the three of us went to lunch at the Women's Faculty Club with a, a very wonderful donor who had given $50,000 to start a kind of a crummy constitutional law research project. And no one had ever picked it up. No one had ever started it. No one wanted to do it, blah, blah, blah. So Herma said, well, would you consider shifting your 50,000 gift to start this center? And he said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that was great. So we really got going in 1999. So Eleanor, you mentioned in the course of your last question that you were serving as associate dean under Herma. And and I think about that and I kind of marvel. I, I was associate dean for a while and that job is not for the faint hearted. It is a very demanding job. And I think about how it must have felt as somebody who had had to bring an action against the university to get tenure to then be associate dean. How did you think about taking on that responsibility? Well, it was um, several years later. Uh, Herma was not well, Herma was appointed dean, I think, in 1992. And my husband, Robert Cole, served as her associate dean. In fact, he led this movement for the um, uh, solution to the admissions process. And he wrote the Cole Report uh, with help of some other faculty uh, of how to change our whole approach to admissions in order to uh, really sell the school, uh, be more uh, aggressive 
in uh, the admissions, but also show our values. So he really changed the whole face of, in, in addition to uh, uh, some of the things that happened in the school, his work on admissions really changed um, and turned turned the situation around. So and I think that's still true. I mean, we're still known for having a different kind of an admissions yes, process. Yes, I think so. And yeah, and yeah. it's been it's been incredibly effective yes. at increasing the numbers of students of color at the yes. school. Yes, yeah, that's great. So, um, uh, well, I think that um, uh, Herma. <laughs> You know, she she's a very canny person, and I think she uh, picked me because she knew I would do the job and really devote myself to it. And um, uh, by that time, uh, the really negative uh, faculty who had been so hard on Marge and me, um, you know, that's almost uh, 15 years later, yeah. and many of them had passed away. <laughs> the worst ones had. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and she asked Bob, and he was kind of a lone wolf too, but he did this terrific job for her as associate dean, and then she, she asked me. So why she did, I don't know, but I had a good time working, mm -hmm. on, working on the center uh, for her. And so, um, I remember when I became associate dean, you had the best organized binder of oh. things that that you presented me with. How and great! <laughs> yeah, and I, it, it's actually really funny. I learned so much from it because I had started being associate dean eighteen months after I arrived yeah, in the institution, so I had no idea where the bodies were buried, and yeah. that helped me figure it out. Yeah, and I did the same thing for my successor, who was a, a man, who never even opened it. Oh my god. You know, it was just yeah. like he was not interested, but yeah. I was interested and yeah. I learned greatly from yeah. that. Well, that's such a lesson. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um so can you tell me about any other service to the law school that was important to you during your wow, you retired in 2014, is I that right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, well, um you know, it's it's what every faculty member does. But I was the advisor to the California Law Review for 10 years. I had a lot of fun with them. I served on uh, an AALS committee to establish uh, two conferences in evidence. And then I was elected to give the graduation speech to the uh, graduating students four times. So <laughs> That's got to be some kind of record. I was popular. Yes. Yeah. So um, and then I, I decided that um, it was uh, time for me to do something else. And in, in uh, early, uh, I think about 2010, um, I was persuaded to run for president of the Women's Faculty Club. And uh, I, I did that, and I was elected. and. Uh, uh, nominated to be the president, and I have just loved it. I've really, um, it's another kind of way in which my interest in organization and my interest in committees, I was student council president in high school, so now I'm the president of this board, I get them together, we meet, we have an agenda, we talk, etc. So. And we've um, made a lot of changes. We've made a lot of changes. Can you talk about some of those? Well, the main one is we started this uh, fundraising campaign because the 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 club, which as you know is open to all faculty at Berkeley, even though it's called the Women's Faculty Club, um, uh, really is a hundred. The building is a uh, hundred years old, and so we need uh, funds to really keep it up and restore it. So we uh, entered into the first major fundraising uh, effort um, about, I think we started about five years ago. And we've done very well. We set our goal as a million. And uh, we're not quite there, but we have a few more months in 2019. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it's just been great for me. We have men on the board and women on the board. We meet. We have committees. And uh, it just brings out all my organizational uh, abilities again. So I've had a wonderful time there. And the club has really flourished. Um, it's got, as you know, great programs, great music, great talks. And um, uh, it's just a real icon on the and, and the best food on campus. I was going to say, <laughs> very good food. <laughs> Eleanor, it's been so much fun talking <laughs> to you. I've heard some of these stories before, and every time you talk about them, I learn something new. <laughs> and this was no exception. So if I can ask one more thing, I'm just curious about what's next for you. You've given us so many chapters of your lives, and what do you see unfolding now? Well, I'm not quite done with the Women's Faculty Club yet. I, I think that uh, any organization needs new blood, and you don't want to outlive your welcome. So within probably the next year, I'd like to finish the campaign, raise the money, et cetera. So maybe within a year, I'll find something else. And then I really have no idea. Um, uh, maybe I'll have a grandchild. That would be great. Uh, maybe Bob and I can travel a little bit more um, while we're both still very healthy. And uh, I, I might find something in the community. I really don't know. So thank you. Oh, this was thank great. Thank you. I enjoyed <laughs> it so much. Good.